Welcome to Navara Live on a day where the UK finally seems to be waking up to the fact that Israel has become a criminal enterprise that will kill anything and anyone to get their way, including British citizens. But will that mean we finally stop sending the Israelis lethal weapons? I'll go through the latest developments on that story and speak to an incredibly impressive doctor who spent two weeks this year working in Gaza. In the second half of the show, I'll be joined by Dahlia Gabriel to discuss the latest ridiculous defense of Israel from US spokesperson John Kirby. We've shown you quite a lot of this guy um, throughout this war, probably the most shameless of the American spokespeople when it comes to covering Israel, whatever they do, every single action they do, he is willing to cover for, cover for. Um, and especially that's clear in this clip. And we'll also look at Krishnan Guru Murphy running rings around the new government spokesperson for Israel. Yes, the one who used to be director of Labour Friends of Israel. It's somewhat strange. The three Britons killed in an Israeli airstrike on a humanitarian convoy in Gaza have been named. 57-year-old John Chapman, 33-year-old James Henderson, and 47-year-old James Kirby were working for World Central Kitchen as part of the organization's security team when they were killed. All of them were former British military. The family of one of those men, James Kirby, told Sky News this. Not only James, but the six other individuals. Yeah. They're, they're heroes to us. They, they went out there selflessly to help the desperate, some of the most desperate people in the world at the moment. How this has happened is, is beyond uh, any sort of recognition of how it could happen. Um, we, for me personally, I just hope this is a turning point in, in the world now and, and what's happening in Gaza. I don't want to make a political thing of it, but we just hope that world leaders can get together and, and help these people. It is people at the end of the day, civilians. And that's what James was out there and the other six individuals are trying to do. Really lovely, dignified response from the, the family of someone who's been brutally killed, um, you know, trying to help people, essentially. Chapman, Kirby and Henderson were killed alongside Australian Zomi Franconi, Polish citizen Damien Sobol, Palestinian Saif Issam Abu Taha and US-Canada dual citizen Jacob Flickinger. Um, more details have emerged of the circumstances of the killing. The seven workers were killed when Israeli drones fired on their convoy heading south from Deir el Bala along the Al Urshid Road. Now, the vehicles were struck in succession, with each vehicle reportedly picking up survivors from the previous strikes. The first two vehicles were hit around 800 meters apart, with the third struck around a mile and a half further south. Those strikes came despite the organization having informed the IDF of their movements in advance, and the World Central Kitchen logos on the roofs and the doors of the vehicles offered no protection either. Israel has said it has conducted a preliminary investigation, and the IDF's chief of general staff, Herzi Halevi, said this. I want to be very clear. The strike was not carried out with the intention of harming WCK aid workers. It was a mistake that followed a misidentification at night during a war in a very complex conditions. It shouldn't have happened. The initial findings were just presented to me here in the Southern Command. I also visited the new humanitarian command center that we established today to improve the way we coordinate aid distribution in Gaza. We will continue taking immediate actions to ensure that more is done to protect humanitarian aid workers. This incident was a grave mistake. Alevi said that the strike was carried out with no intention of harming the WCK workers, but military insiders told Haaretz the convoy was targeted because the IDF believed a Hamas fighter was with them. There was no Hamas fighter in the convoy. Now, maybe it is the case that the IDF thought they were targeting a Hamas fighter, but if that's so, and it's a big if, it would also show that the IDF didn't hesitate to treat a significant number of aid workers as completely disposable, collateral damage. Haaretz has more today on how the killings may have been allowed to happen. They say that according to Israeli army sources, the aid workers were killed because, quote, IDF officers on the ground 
do what they want. Internally, Haaretz reports that the Defence Ministry is blaming poor coordination between troops on the ground and officials from the aid organisation, but a Haaretz intelligence source rejected that explanation, with the paper reporting this. A source in the intelligence branch said the command knows exactly what the cause of the attack was. In Gaza, everyone does as he pleases. Army regulations say that final approval for any action against sensitive targets like aid organisations must be given by senior officers, the division commander, the head of the command, or even the chief of staff. But in Gaza, the source said, every commander sets the rules for himself and gives his own interpretation of the rules of engagement. It has no connection to coordination. You can set up another 20 administrations or war rooms, but if someone doesn't decide to put an end to the conduct of some of the troops inside Gaza, we'll see more incidents like this. On Sky News, those claims were put to IDF spokesperson Peter Lerner. One Israeli army source has told the the Israeli newspaper Haaretz that the incident has no connection with coordination and instead it was caused by the fact that in Gaza every commander sets the rules for himself. Is that the case? Are Are there parts of the IDF that are out of control in Gaza? Absolutely not. I think that, you know, there is a a rumor mill that runs throughout Israeli media, uh, like in the the, uh, other world media. We need to get to facts, not fiction. The IDF is a disciplined professional military. It does not mean that there can't be mistakes on the ground. Uh, But no, I would absolutely not accept that uh, term of what was reported in Haaretz. Someone who disagrees with Peter Lerner is veteran war journalist John Simpson, who said this, Over the years, I've lost two friends, one Palestinian and one Lebanese, and nearly lost a third, a French cameraman, to the willingness of IDF soldiers to open fire, even though they knew perfectly well who they were. But they felt sure their superiors would protect them. The killing of the humanitarian workers by IDF weaponry has led to a global outcry. And Britain is no exception, with the media uniting in its demands for answers from Israel over the killing of free British citizens. The right-wing Daily Express showed an image of one of the blown-out vehicles over the headline, Free Britain's Killed on Gaza Mercy Mission. The mirror went with killed trying to feed starving kids. And the Daily Mail highlighted the military background of the Britons with the headline, Free UK Forces Veterans Killed by Israeli Strike. At least two of the men are believed to have served with the Royal Marines and all three were employed by the firm Solace Global. That's a risk management company based in Poole who appear to have been providing security for World Central Kitchen in Gaza. And the men's military experience has led some online to speculate that perhaps they were spies or special operations. Now, I've obviously got no idea, but in response, retired Major General Charlie Herbert has said, This, avoid speculation about ex-military nature of the free British aid workers killed in Gaza. Entirely normal for NGOs to use ex-military private security companies in very high-risk areas. Don't read much into it. And then he's got a picture, and which he says is taken in 2019 Mogadishu with my South African former Special Forces CPO. The presence of armed security wasn't enough to protect those seven humanitarian workers from free separate missiles fired by Israel's pilotless drones, though. And the nature of that attack on the convoy was even enough to lose Israel the support of one of its most vociferous defenders. This was LBC's Nick Ferrari. Certainly I'm a friend of Jewish people, which I suppose makes me a friend of Israel. And sometimes it takes a friend to tell a friend where they're going wrong. And that is this moment. This is indefensible. I've made a point of actually getting in a little earlier than usual to read as much as I possibly can about the events that led to the death of these seven aid workers. And every single fact is horrific. Not least the vehicles, as I think you probably all know, because you'll have seen in newspaper photographs or on TV, they're all clearly displayed as carrying aid workers. They have the various emblems and everything else. Did you know they're also operating on routes that are approved by the Israeli Defence Forces? So these are routes that they know these vehicles go down to facilitate facilitate aid getting into Gaza. So they're clearly marked vehicles on pre-designated routes and supposedly we're told the precision of the Israeli military, which we're meant to believe is one of the greatest on earth, with three separate strikes 
with time apart from them, authorised, again, I read, but it needs a senior military figure, it needs a military lawyer, whatever that is, it needs an area commander, and still this went ahead. So uh, from one friend to another, this has to stop. And I would suggest that at the very least, when you consider that it is possible, I don't know anything about drone missiles, but presumably it's possible the missiles that we sell to Israel have just killed three of our own citizens, along with four other innocent workers, all of the Britons, I understand, who served in the military, some with a degree of distinction, and it could have been our own missiles that killed them. I would suggest now is the time that we suspend, temporarily suspend the sale of arms to Israel because some message has to get through. Now, I've seen lots of people, I think, very justifiably frustrated that it has taken the, the killing of, of British citizens for the message to get through to certain commentators and certain politicians that what Israel are doing is unacceptable. They've killed 32,000 Palestinians. They've killed 200 Palestinian or mostly Palestinian aid workers. And there's been pretty much silence. But now it's free British people and, you know, free British veterans, no less. That's when a line has been crossed. Now, I do think that that is completely reasonable. At the same time, um, I sort of am, am reluctant when people are sort of coming on board, realizing um, that we shouldn't be sending arms to, to Israel to sort of then punish them for their sort of past errors. I know people have different attitudes when it comes to this. Uh, I think it's very much reasonable to be frustrated. I should be, be clear about that. Um, even if he has come late to this, Nick Ferrari is to some degree ahead of the political curve because Britain's politicians aren't showing much sign of following suit, especially when it comes to sending arms to Israel. Now, in an interview with The Sun, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said this about continuing arms exports to Israel. I think we've always have a very careful export licensing regime uh, that we adhere to. There are a set of rules, regulations and procedures that we'll always follow. And I've been consistently clear with Prime Minister Netanyahu since the start of this conflict that whilst, of course, we defend Israel's right to defend itself and its people against attacks from Hamas, they have to do that in accordance with international humanitarian law. Completely meaningless. You have to act within international humanitarian law, but we're going to let you do your own investigations or we're going to send you military arms, whatever happens. We also know, by the way, that the government has received advice from its own lawyers that Israel isn't following international humanitarian law. So Rishi Sunak saying, oh, we've been very clear to them, we've been very clear that they should be following international law, but we're still going to send them weapons anyway. Um, the UK tends to just abstain when it comes to UN Security Council, so we're providing them military and diplomatic cover, but we're asking them nicely to follow humanitarian law. Now, finally, this has become sort of problematic and controversial for the government because as Nick Ferrari said, it may be the case that those three British citizens were killed with weapons supplied by the British, or at least with, with parts supplied by the British. Um, but Labour aren't really sounding too different. Now, on Good Morning Britain, um, Labour's Darren Jones was also asked about arms sales to Israel. There's, there's a widespread call around the world today to stop sending arms to Israel, that the Americans should stop doing it and we should stop doing it. Would you support that? Well, I can understand in the circumstances why people would call for that, and that's why we all want the war to stop. The fact of the matter is, if the UK, for example, stopped supplying arms, the war would not end. What we need to do is get the parties to a position where the fighting can stop. And I think what we've seen from President Biden from Keir Starmer and now from Lord Cameron, our own foreign secretary, is that countries that supported Israel's right to defend itself and to recover its hostages from Hamas terrorists in Gaza, which clearly is their right to have done in the first place, have all said that you've gone too far, uh, that we need to bring this war to an end. We need to get around the negotiating table. We need to allow aid to get to people who desperately need it in Gaza. And this latest situation, not only has it resulted in the death of aid workers, which is unacceptable, but it's now making it much harder for aid to be made available to people who are in the most desperate situation. So it's pretty much completely meaningless, right? Um, oh, we, we, we would like the war to end, yada, 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 words, 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 but we would still send Israel weapons because if we were to stop sending Israel weapons, the war would continue anyway, right? That's, you, you've had Labour MPs kicked out of the party for daring to suggest that Israel might be committing a genocide, right? What, what impact does that have on the war? 
Now we can say, oh, it, it, it really matters what language you use about the war in Gaza, even though that has absolutely no impact on how many people get killed on either side. But sending weapons, um, yeah, it might make some difference, but it won't make much difference, so we might as well keep on doing it. That's basically the Labour position as expressed this morning. And I say as expressed this morning because since then, um, Labour have somewhat changed their tune. Um, Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy told the BBC this. I have now been calling for 12 days for David Cameron to publish the legal advice so that we are clear on whether Israel has contravened international humanitarian law and therefore arms sales should be suspended. All of the British public can see the scenes coming out of Gaza, children lying in rubble, deep concerns being made about international human rights law. And for all of those reasons, that advice should be published. Uh, and if it is the case that international law has been contravened, then it's absolutely right that offensive arms are suspended to Israel. This has happened in the past. It happened under the Margaret Thatcher administration, and it happened under Gordon Brown's administration. So there is precedent, but it's important now that that advice is published and so that we can all be clear that if there has been a breach in international humanitarian law, and I must say that I do have very serious concerns, uh, that arms sales are suspended. Now, this is very much classic Labour. As I say, slightly stronger um, than what Darren Jones was sent out with this morning, but still saying, oh, we think that they Britain should stop sending arms if the legal advice is that they're breaking international law. And so our demand is for the government to publish its legal advice. And then if Israel are breaking international law to suspend arms sales. Now, important context here is governments don't normally publish legal advice. So in fact, it's sort of a convention that, that they don't, right? Sometimes you get a legal presentation from the government. There was a, a, a period during the Brexit negotiations where the court told them to, le to, to release a certain piece of legal advice. But I think the Labour Party, you know, know here that it's very unlikely for that to happen. So while they sound like they've got a stronger position, they are essentially still sitting on the fence. Um, other politicians, though, are sounding a little bit more strong on this issue, coming to some actual concrete conclusions. Listen to this from crossbench peer Peter Ricketts on Radio 4. He was chair of the Joint Intelligence Committee during the Blair government and a national security advisor under Cameron's premiership. I think there's abundant evidence now that Israel hasn't been um, taking enough care to fulfill its obligations uh, on the safety of civilians. And a country uh, that gets arms from the UK uh, has to comply with international humanitarian law. That's a condition of the arms export license. So honestly, I think the time has come to send that signal. It won't change the course of the war. It would be a powerful political message. And it might just stimulate debate in the US as well, which would be the real game changer if the Americans began to think about putting um, limits, restrictions on the use of American weapons in Israel. That's really the key point here. So it, it seems to me, you know, the Darren Jones line this morning, it wouldn't make any difference if Britain stopped sending weapons to, to, to Israel. Well, arguments can be made either way. You know, Israel presumably could continue to fight this war if it weren't for British weapons. But if Britain does it, then that does put more pressure on the United States. And if the United States stopped sending weapons to Israel, then the war would end. Right. So that is real influence. That is real impact, which I think any objective observer, sorry, um, can see very clearly. Um, free conservative MPs have also come out against further arms exports to Israel. Um, for their part, the SNP um, have been calling for an end to arms sales long before the strikes on the humanitarian convoy on Monday night. And in response to that particular attack, their Westminster leader, Stephen Flynn, has written an open letter to Sunak Starmer and common speaker Lindsay Hoyle saying this. With three UK citizens among those killed in the Israeli strike on World Central Kitchen aid workers, it is essential that the UK Parliament is recalled immediately. This situation demands that the Prime Minister comes to Parliament without further delay to outline the UK government's response to the killing of UK citizens by Israel to enable MPs to scrutinise the UK government's response and so that Parliament can finally debate the vote on ending arms sales to Israel. Um, I think that's a good statement. 
by Stephen Flynn, this idea that this is important enough to, to recall Parliament. Free, free British citizens have been killed here, right? Now, you might say, morally, um, that's no different to, to Palestinians being killed. I absolutely agree with you. But there is a difference when it comes to the responsibility of the British government, which is, you know, above all, to protect the lives of their own citizens. And so it, it should be, to me, a reason to recall Parliament if free British citizens have been killed potentially using British weapons. And the Lib Dems have called for a suspension of arms sales too. Um, leader Ed Davey told Channel 4 News this. It's absolutely shocking uh, that these aid workers have been killed uh, in Gaza. And um, I really think is now is the time to end uh, British exports of arms to Israel. It does look like Israel has broken humanitarian law. And we really shouldn't be exporting arms to any country that breaks international humanitarian law. And the Democrats have been calling for a long time for immediate bilateral ceasefire. The Israelis have not uh, uh, listened to international pressure on that. And so I think by ending British arms exports to Israel, it would send a very, very powerful signal, and including not just to Israel, but to America, who supplies most of arms to Israel. And hopefully they will uh, review that policy. The views of the Lib Dems and the SNP seem to be reflecting the public mood on this, as according to new polling from YouGov reported in The Guardian. Now, it shows that 56% of Britons are in favour of a ban on the exports of arms and spare parts to Israel, while just 17% are against. And 59% of voters now say that Israel is violating human rights in Gaza, with just 12% saying they aren't. Those numbers are striking, and they shouldn't be a surprise. It's plain and obvious to any right-thinking person that Israel's war isn't just about targeting a militant group. It's about destroying the basis of life for two million Palestinians. That's included the bombing of whole families, the deprivation of food to two million people, and as we've now been reminded in tragic fashion, the casual murder of people trying to deliver much-needed food. And it's also involved the systematic destruction of hospitals. Earlier today, I spoke to another volunteer who risked life and limb to provide support for the besieged people of Gaza. Nick Maynard is a consultant surgeon who has worked in Gaza with medical aid for Palestinians, including a two-week stint this January at Al-Aqsa Hospital. I began our conversation by asking Nick to outline his experiences working in Gaza earlier this year. I've been going to Gaza for nearly 15 years, since 2010. So I know the healthcare system there extremely well. I've worked in the hospitals, I've operated in the operating theatres, and I assumed that I would be ready for what I was going to see when I went out there uh, in, at the end of December and into January of this year. A and I think it's fair to say it was far, far worse than I had expected. The healthcare system there is in a state of near total collapse. I was working in Al-Aqsa Hospital, which was at the time thought to be one of the properly functioning hospitals, but it wasn't properly functioning at all, and none of the hospitals are functioning in Gaza. It was receiving huge numbers of trauma victims. Uh, the capacity of the hospital was three or four times what was normal. Um, and it couldn't cope with those numbers of victims. It couldn't treat anything else other than trauma. So the healthcare system had virtually collapsed. And we saw just the most awful injuries, in many of them in small children, multiple traumatic amputations, terrible burns, which were unsurvivable. Um, and I spent most of my time operating on people with severe bomb injuries to the abdomen and to the chest. So, yes, it was far worse than I expected uh, 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 and really horrific things that we saw. Leading the news over the past um, 24 hours has been sort of the tragic death of these free British aid workers. Of course, big news here because um, they're British citizens. Um, lots of medics have, of course, also been killed over the past six months. Did you sort of question whether it was a, a good idea to to go to Gaza knowing that aid workers and medics were really risking their lives by even being in the Gaza Strip? Yes, I did. I questioned it a lot. And I spoke at length to my wife, um, my children, who who are all adults now, but I spoke to them and my even my elderly 94-year-old mother I spoke to at length and my siblings. So 
it was not a decision taken lightly. Um, but I have very strong connections to Gaza. I have many close friends, people I'd call family out there. And their need was absolutely enormous. Uh, I spoke to them on the phone or WhatsApp them and they just and they were begging for help. So I, I felt I had no option but to do so. But I was very aware of the risks. Um, and I did I did have the huge support of my wife and family in going out there. Imagine the the support of your, as you say, your wife and family was absolutely essential here. Um, what about the British state? So did you get any support from the British government to say, look, you're a British citizen, you're going to Gaza to do something that you know, any right-minded person or any right-minded person, sorry, would see as being a very worthy, righteous thing to do. You know, you're going there to to help people get medical care in a war zone. Did the British government sort of provide you with any support that, that you thought sort of reassured you that you would be safe there? No, uh, to be honest, we didn't seek a huge amount of support from the government. Um, the, I, I went in with Medical Aid for Palestinians, which is a wonderful UK charity. Um, and we had enormous support from them. They're wonderful staff in the UK, but they're truly inspirational staff on the ground in Gaza. Um, so we had huge support from them. But the the government, we didn't seek their approval or not. Um, we, we went in with MAP through the WHO emergency medical team mechanism. Uh, we, we did meet up with uh, members of uh, representatives of the UN when we were in Cairo. We met up with the deputy ambassador in Cairo. Um, but uh, to be honest, the the briefing that they had 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 been fairly minimal. And so we really went in mainly with the faith in medical aid for Palestinians. And they were a wonderful support to us when we were there. And we keep hearing from especially Israeli spokespeople over the past 24 hours or so. They seem to be saying, Oh, yes, um, this World Central Kitchen, this organization, actually, these are genuine humanitarians. These were some of the good guys. And so we are generally, genuinely sorry for, well, actually, they, they haven't said sorry, but it was a genuine mistake or it, it, it's regretful um, that they have been killed, I think, is some of the language that's being used by the Israelis. Now, when they call World Central Kitchen some of the good guys, the implication tends to be um, that lots of the other people who are doing humanitarian work in Gaza aren't. Right. So there's a there's a real attempt to sort of smear shed loads of people working for all sorts of different organizations as, you know, closet Hamas fighters. I mean, how have you felt sort of over the past 24 hours seeing the way that this particular tragedy, these seven aid workers being killed, has been treated somewhat differently to the 200 other aid workers who've been killed over the past six months? I don't pay pay, pay any real attention to what the Israeli government or the Israeli Defence Force have said, I think they are lying. I do not attach any credibility to their statements. This is something we have seen repeatedly since October the 7th, uh, repeated attacks on healthcare workers. Um, I've met, as you can imagine, many, many healthcare workers and aid workers in Gaza, and they are, without exception, the most remarkable a group of people, utterly inspirational people who put their lives at risk to go and help the innocent guards and civilians who are being destroyed by the attacks from the Israeli Defence Force. So this is, you know, I, I'm I, I'm I'm really pleased the media is making this story so prominent. But one could equally question why the media hasn't given prominence to many other stories of attacks on healthcare workers and aid workers that have been repeatedly occurring since October the 7th. Uh, so I, I, witnessing what has happened has been horrific. Um, uh, and I think the world needs to realise that the Israeli Defence Force are deliberately attacking healthcare workers, aid workers. The whole healthcare system is being systematically destroyed by the Israeli Defence Force and dismantling it to make Gaza utterly uninhabitable. So they are behaving as they have done over the last six months. We've heard actually stories of 
of, of Israelis, and this is coming often from medics who have been working in, 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 in Gaza, of um, Israeli troops intentionally targeting medics and people sort of taking off their scrubs because they think that wearing their scrubs, so their, you know, their medical gear, that could specifically make them a target. Now, was that something that you were sort of aware of when, when you were in Gaza? Did you feel that sort of, uh, you know, identifying yourself as a doctor put yourself under more threat from, from, from the IDF? I didn't experience that when I was at Al-Aqsa, but that was almost three months ago. And I think to be fair, I mean, we were the very first UK medical team that went into Gaza. And I think we believed the deconfliction process was going to work. Um, every day we had to, or our, our map Gaza and representatives had to contact COGAT to ensure that the route to the hospital and the hospital were deconflicted. And we believed in that process. Now, maybe that was naive of us, um, but we believed in it at the time. But we realized towards the end of our stay that it meant very little to be told by the IDF that the area was deconflicted. And our experience at Al Aqsa Hospital, we had to withdraw from the hospital two days before the end of our stay because there was a missile attack by the IDF on the intensive care unit just a few meters away from the operating theater that I was operating in at the time, saving a young lady's life who had been blown up by an Israeli bomb. So we lost faith in the deconfliction process since then. And I think what we've seen repeatedly over the last few weeks ha has reinforced that view that the Israeli Defense Force are not protecting aid workers and healthcare workers. And the stories that you have, we've all heard about uh, doctors changing out their scrubs, putting on civilian clothes because they don't want to be targets. And I've heard that from people I know at Shifa Hospital in the last few in the last few days before it was completely destroyed. So yes, they are targeting healthcare workers. We, I know people who've been killed at Shifa Hospital. A doctor, a plastic surgeon, um, who I, I met when I was in, in Shifa Hospital last May, was executed with his mother three days ago. We've seen photographs of healthcare workers handcuffed with hands behind their back having been killed. So yes, they are being deliberately targeted. I just want to ask you to sort of flesh out. You, you've said this doctor that you you know was executed with with his mother. I mean, can you give us any more any more details about? I mean, first of all, our you know condolences for 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 for, for this person that you you clearly know and have a lot of affection for has been killed in a brutal way. But could we get some more sort of details from you of of, of precisely what you understand happened in that situation? I've heard this from a, a close friend of mine who is. Chief of Surgery at Shifa Hospital, who's been interviewed in the last two or three days. Um, and I've seen photographs. I, I met this surgeon. He was not a close friend. I met him when I was operating in Shifa Hospital last May. Um, but I know people who know him extremely well. Um, and he was a hardworking, young, plastic reconstructive surgeon. And he was one of the doctors who stayed in Shifa Hospital whilst has been besieged over the last two weeks. And he and his mother, who was a physician there as well, were both killed by Israeli Defense Force soldiers um, the other day. And their bodies were, were, were discovered by friends of mine um, uh, in the hospital. And so this is in Shifa, isn't it? So this is where we're hearing from the Israelis. They say, oh, yes, lots of people were killed at Shifa, um, but the people who were killed were militants. Um, and that's because Shifa was being used essentially as a base for for Hamas fighters. Now, you're saying, you know, some of the people who were killed um, at Shifa and they were doctors, right? They were not militants. What do you make of that claim that, that Israel keeps putting forward that, well, first of all, they say, oh, we didn't mean to kill anyone. And they say, oh, we did kill them, but actually they were Hamas. In the, the specific circumstances of Shifa, perhaps, um, what have you made of, of those Israeli claims that it was being used as a base for militants? Clearly, I haven't been in Shifa in recent weeks, so I can only go by what has been told to me by my close friends and colleagues whom I've known for many, many years. But I've worked in Shifa Hospital. I was there in May of, of last year operating. I've been there on many occasions in the past. I, On every visit, I have had unrestricted access to every part of the hospital, and I've never seen 
any evidence of any military activity, no evidence of Hamas militants in all the visits I've had to Shifa. Now, I haven't been there in recent weeks, so I have to rely upon the testimony of people I've known for many years. But these are people who I trust implicitly. They're, they're doctors. They're in Shifa Hospital saving lives as much as they possibly can. And I have had heard repeated testimonies from, from such people saying that this is never, there is no evidence to support the contention that Shifa Hospital has been used as a command centre. I wondered if we could just return. There was a, something you mentioned in a previous answer that I would like to get some more, more detail on because, it, I mean, it sounds quite a, a shocking situation. So you're saying you, you were, there was a moment in um, Al-Aqsa Hospital where you were conducting surgery on someone when an Israeli missile lands um, sort of a, at a building nearby, if I recall that, that correctly. I wondered if you could just sort of talk about that experience. What happens when you're in an, an operating room and then all of a sudden you hear a bomb land in incredibly nearby. What, what, what are the moments that follow that situation? I was operating in Al-Aqsa Hospital uh, on a, a young lady who who was a victim of a, of a bomb explosion. We're, we're hearing bombs going off the whole time. So the whole of my two weeks in Gaza, virtually nonstop, you could hear bombs going off. Um, where we were staying, we barely slept at night because of the amount of times that bombs are going off and the house was shaking or we heard machine gun fire. And in the hospital, it was a similar. We could hear bombs going off all the time. So to be honest, you just crack on with your work and you believe in the process that you've been, the deconfliction process that you've been assured by COGAT that the hospital will be protected. And so when we heard another bomb going off, we didn't really change what we were doing. We just carried on operating. It was only when I'd finished the operation and came out of the operating theatre at about quarter of three on afternoon that I heard that the intensive care unit had been attacked by a missile attack. And we then saw lots of victims coming in from single gunshot wounds. And bear in mind that virtually all the victims we were seeing over two were, were bomb victims. It was unusual seeing gunshot victims, and and there was a lot of talk about Israeli snipers being in the close environment of the hospital and were shooting individuals. Now, I would stress I did not see any snipers, but there was a lot of talk about them, and we certainly saw a lot of people coming in with single gunshot, gunshot wounds. And the intensive care unit wall had a huge hole in it. Now, no one was killed by that, um, but it was a clear missile attack by the IDF. And that led to our rapid withdrawal from Al-Aqsa Hospital for safety ground, for safety reasons. Um, MSF were in the hospital as well. Uh, they evacuated immediately as well. And so overnight, all foreign doctors left the hospital. And of course, that gives a very clear signal to the local doctors. And they all, or not all of them, but many of them withdrew from the hospital. So as a result of that missile attack on the intensive care unit, the whole hospital became rapidly disabled um, for probably about two weeks until it started working again. Um, so it was a really dramatic um, effect on the, on, on the workforce of the hospital because of that attack. Of course, we might be seeing a similar process now in terms of food provision, because it's people who are sort of carrying out the, the, the distribution of food who are, who are finding themselves killed by the Israeli military. And that will have a, you know, a massive knock on effect on the other people's sort of ability to, to carry out their jobs, their sort of very important tasks. Um, finally, um, it, it's been very difficult for foreign media to enter Gaza to sort of get a, a sense of what is going on on the front line, on the ground. In Gaza, so it's it's medics and other volunteers who have been, I suppose, some of the people with the uh, the best ability to speak about what is actually going on on the ground. And I suppose I want to know from from you if you feel like the British political establishment, so the government or the opposition, do you feel like the reality you have been describing is being taken on board by the British government? Do you think you're being taken seriously? I think belatedly, yes, but it's taken a long time. Uh, I, I, 
I've had meetings and others have had meetings with senior members of the government and the foreign office, and uh, they did take notice. And I, I, I believe the messaging coming out, certainly from Lord Cameron, um, is ch has changed in recent weeks. One could argue this is far too late, that it's six months down the road. But I think they are now beginning to take heed of what people on the ground in Gaza are telling them about the atrocities that are taking place. Now, we all wish for stronger actions from our governments because that is the only way the Israelis will be stopped. Um, and at the moment, they are still carrying out uh, these appalling atrocities, really without any restriction at all from the rest of the world. Even after the killing of seven aid workers, including three Brits and an American, the White House is sticking to its role as Israel's greatest cheerleader. National security spokesperson John Kirby has continued to take on that task with gusto. The president on February 8th issued a memo and it said, uh, and you already know this, but just for context, it said that it was the policy of this administration to prevent arms transfers that risked facilitating or otherwise contributing to violations of human rights or international humanitarian law. Is firing a missile at people delivering food and killing them not a violation of international humanitarian law? Well, the Israelis have already admitted that uh, this was a mistake that they made. They're doing investigation. They'll get to the bottom of this. Let's not get ahead of that. Um, your, your question presumes at this very early hour that it was a deliberate strike, that they knew exactly what they were hitting, that they were hitting aid workers and did it on purpose. And there's no evidence of that. I would also remind you, sir, that we continue to look at incidents as they occur. The State Department has a process in place. And to date, as you and I are speaking, they have not found any incidents where the Israelis have violated international humanitarian law. And lest you think we don't take it seriously, I can assure you that we do. We look at this in real time. They have never violated international humanitarian law ever in the past five to six months. I'm telling you, the State Department has looked at incidents in the past and has yet to determine that any of those incidents violate international humanitarian law. Unless you think we don't take international law seriously, right? That, that's his challenge. Well, you, you surely think we take international law seriously, and then you should accept that our judgment is that Israel has never, or not since October the 7th at least, broken international law. Maybe we don't take you very seriously, John Kirby. Maybe one of the reasons we don't take you seriously is, is because of answers like that, right? Israel has killed 32,000 people, the majority of them civilians. They've bombed hospitals and aid workers, and they've bragged about putting Gaza's 2 million people under siege, right? And John Kirby would perhaps have done well to have taken a look at a submission from Human Rights Watch and Oxfam to the White House showing all the times that they think Israel has demonstrably broken international law. Now, as you can imagine, it's a long list. I'll just show you four of the examples. So they say, Human Rights Watch documented a strike by Israeli forces on a marked ambulance outside Al-Shifa Hospital on November the 3rd, 2023, which reportedly killed 15 people and injured 60. Ambulances are protected civilian objects under international humanitarian law and cannot be targeted when used to treat wounded and sick individuals, both civilian and combatant. Israeli authorities said they intentionally struck the ambulance, contending it was being used to transport able-bodied fighters. Human Rights Watch investigated these claims and did not find any evidence that the ambulance was being used for military purposes. So another, what they think of as a war crime, Human Rights Watch determined based on verified video and witness accounts that Israeli forces used white phosphorus in military operations in Lebanon and Gaza on October the 10th and 11th. Um, and Human Rights Watch documented a strike by Israeli forces on a family in a car in southern Lebanon on November the 5th that killed three girls aged 10, 12, and 14, and their grandmother. Human Rights Watch found no evidence of a military target in the vicinity of the car that was struck, which only contained fleeing civilians. An Oxfam analysis has found that a significant portion of its water, sanitation, and hygiene infrastructure that Oxfam and its WASH partners installed or rehabilitated over the period 2017 to 2023 has been damaged or destroyed by Israeli bombardment, rendering much of it inoperable. The location of this infrastructure were deconflicted through the appropriate channels in order to ensure that Israel was aware of and could avoid damaging facilities that provide essential services to civilians in Gaza. So as I say, 
just four examples there. Um, bombing ambulances. They say, oh, Hamas were in the ambulance. Well, if it was an injured combatant, that's still a war crime. And Human Rights Watch say there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that there were, you know, it was being it was being used by able-bodied militants. No evidence whatsoever. They also say, actually, that even if there had been a militant in there, given that this killed 15 people and injured 60, there's some serious questions about whether that would have been proportionate. We've also got Oxfam saying they're destroying all the water facilities. I said, we told them where the water facilities were. They still bombed them, right? The lawyers at Human Rights Watch think these are, these are clear um, breaches of international humanitarian law. But according to the Americans, everything's fine and dandy, right? It's fine. Oh, we've looked at it. Trust us. We, our lawyers have looked at it all. We can't see anything they could have possibly done that might have broken international humanitarian law. These are Israel, our allies, they're the good guys. Now, of course, we know the lawyers of all America's allies don't even agree. So thanks to a leaked report of a Tory MP speaking, we know that the UK government's own lawyers believe Israel is breaking international law. Um, to discuss this story, I'm now joined by Dahlia Gabriel. Dahlia, thank you for your patience. We've taken a while to come to you on this show. It's mainly because that, that interview with Nick Maynard was, was so impressive. I thought he sort of really put forward um, his experiences so powerful, powerfully. But really great um, to, to get you on for your perspectives. Um, my question to you, do you think the US takes international humanitarian law seriously? John Kirby thinks we should. Not only does the US not take international law seriously, they are deeply invested in Israel being able to get away with what they are doing scot-free without real accountability. And this is kind of a, a limitation that is inherent to international law in that international law was not designed in order to stop violence in its tracks when, and you know, when I say international law, I mean the code of the law, but also the institutions of accountability that surround in, the international law, which is as important in many ways as what the law actually says. But international law was not designed in order to stop violence in its tracks when that violence is being conducted by a colonial hegemonic power. Um, it has always contained within it these exceptions and these ambiguities and these kinds of um, uh, places where you can fudge um, action being taken. I think it was very interesting that John Kirby there, he used very specific wording when he was asked. So you're telling me that Israel has not conducted war crimes, committed any war crimes in the past five months. And he says, I am telling you that the US State Department has yet to determine whether or not Israel has committed war crimes. That's very specific wording because it creates this kind of lag in the system and this kind of lag in the process that allows for some kind of plausible deniability. Um, and, you know, international law has and the institutions surrounding it have always kind of had this with this kind of limitation within it. You know, international law was designed to legislate the rules of war between European states. It didn't come out of a context of like, decolonization or things that are really going to be able to encompass um, the kinds of dynamics that are at play here. Um, and, you know, it has always allowed for the powerful to use exception. Um, and Israel has historically been a pioneer of finding and creating exceptions. And the greatest beneficiary of that innovation, that legal and political innovation, has been the US. When you look at, for example, the war on terror, which is, you know, the, 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 the suite of policies and state practices that defines 21st century United States statecraft, that was formed on the blueprint of the kinds of states of exception that Israel had developed through their political alliances, through their legal innovations, their legal technologies, their ways of skirting accountability in the moment, or being able to make a legal case that what they are doing um, should sit outside the realms of international law, for example, by creating ever-ending and ever-expanding um, and ambiguous boundaries around the definition of terrorism and terrorist sympathy. That then formed the blueprint of all of the various um, violations of international norms that the war on terror um, has has it has had um, not to mention the explicitly illegal war of the war in Iraq, which still no one has actually been held accountable for. To all the varying kinds of things that have actually 
been technically legal within the realm of this exception of terrorism, um, but actually do violate some core international norms and rights. So in a sense, to kind of portray Israel as a rogue state that is somehow acting separately from what the US desires at its core, even if the US might have sort of like some specific oppositions or some specific discomforts with, for example, the way that Israel might be making it harder for them to defend them. Um, But fundamentally, the US is very invested in the idea that a colonial power like Israel, that is its ally, is able to get away with whatever it is trying to do without actually facing real time accountability or even retroactive accountability. So it's not just that they don't take international law seriously. It's they are that they are invested in international law not being applied equally um, to and rigorously to a state like Israel. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I suppose that, that distinction as well between sort of the content of international law and then how it's applied. Because when it comes to the content, I think lots of people argue that yes, well, the origins of international law did come to some degree out of out of colonialism. It gives lots of power, for example, to to a sort of um you know a, a formal military and then doesn't really give any rights to a a uh, sort of resistance movement now some of that changed in the 1970s because at the un you sort of had powerful third world countries who sort of put into international law more rights for resistance movements but then it's the application that matters and i think one thing that you know israel and the united states definitely agree on is they do not want any kind of neutral formal organization to function Right. So you might say that international law is a tool of colonial powers. You might say it can be used um, to resist colonialism. I think probably both of those things are are true. But the only way it's ever going to serve towards justice is if you've got this independent body that can actually you know, make rulings and enforce it. And both Israel and the United States are really, really committed to making sure that can't happen. David Mentzer is a former director of Labour Friends of Israel, and he's now an official spokesperson for the Israeli government. Yes, that seems pretty weird to me too. Moving on from that particular detail, Mentzer has been out on the airwaves defending Israel after they killed seven members of the charity World Central Kitchen, including free Britons. Here he is on Channel 4 being interviewed by Krishnan Guru Murphy. Is the Israeli government apologising to the families of the aid workers killed, including the three families in Britain? Well, firstly, thank you, Krishnan, for uh, having me on. Uh, From the Prime Minister to the Defence Minister to the spokesman for the uh, Israel Defence Forces, all of us have expressed breast grief about this occurrence. but are you apologising? To be frank... To be frank, if you let me answer, Krishnan, there's no point attacking me already. I've just arrived, for heaven's sake. I'm not sake. attacking you. I'm just asking uh, you a simple question. I want no, an answer to it. No, you are. are you apologising? And allow me to answer. Allow me to answer. We have expressed grief about this operation, but we need to find out exactly what has happened. The Prime Minister, as he came out of hospital today, the Defence Minister and uh, Minister Gallant have all expressed grief. Indeed, there is a sense of grief of, yeah. across the whole country because WKD are one of the good guys. But you... WKD are one of the good guys. Right, so first things first, the people who were killed by Israel were from the organisation World Central Kitchen, or WCK. Now, this Israeli spokesperson is confusing them with a British Alcopop drink. Now, he is most definitely, I presume, not indigenous to the Middle East. You're confusing this aid organization for a British alcopop. The other thing to notice is the arrogance of Mensa, who thinks being asked to apologize for killing seven innocent aid workers is a personal attack. Stop attacking me. I've already said we feel very sad about it. Why should we say sorry? Oh, because saying sorry would mean you accept responsibility, which you are refusing to do, even though everyone in the entire world can see that you intentionally bomb these people. Finally, by calling WCK, yes, WCK, not WKD, by calling them one of the good guys, Mensa is not being very subtle in suggesting that the other 196 aid workers so far killed in Gaza are fair game. Oh no, these these were actually one of the good guys. The the other aid workers, yeah, we kind of, we didn't mind killing them. Maybe we even did it on purpose. But these ones, oh, we definitely did do that by accident because these are one of the few aid workers in Gaza who we think deserve to live, right? Now, the people Israel doesn't seem to think deserve to live are people from disreputable organizations like the United Nations. 
Now, you can see why Israel hired this guy. He's very similar to Elon Levy, the guy who he has replaced. Um, let's go back to the interview. You said this was In unintentional. This so this was a mistake, wasn't it? So you can apologize already. You don't need to know the, the precise details what? to issue an apology. Clearly. There are grieving families Clearly. tonight. Something there are grieving families, and we grieve with them because clearly something well, catastrophic uh, has happened. You killed them, right? Well done, Krishna and Guru Murphy, for getting to the nub of the point. This isn't about, oh, we're grieving for these people because a tragedy has occurred. You killed them, right? You bombed free cars with clear markings that said they were delivering food. Now, whoever was controlling those drones didn't seem to mind. They were still fair game. Seven people are now dead. You can't just say, oh, we're grieving. You did it. Let's go back to that interview. We're going to get to the bottom of this and find out exactly what happened because the, the role of bringing aid to innocent Gazans, to ordinary Gazans, not to Hamas, to the genocidal terror organization Hamas, the, that role is sacrosanct to us, to us. We've got no beef with the people of Gaza, ordinary people. We're trying to get as much aid as we possibly can. I mean, it's We're not, it's, it's not the, sacrosanct. The dilemma, saying things like you're trying to get as much aid as possible is just not true because only a few days ago, the UN's highest court, the ICJ, ordered Israel to, without delay, facilitate humanitarian aid. And tonight, a ship laden with tons of aid is sailing away and humanitarian organisations are saying it is simply too dangerous for them to carry on supplying aid because you kill their aid workers. So it is just not true to say it's sacrosanct. Uh, it absolutely is uh, sacrosanct because before this uh, uh, war, which we didn't want or didn't ask for, there were about 70 aid trucks of food alone, food alone uh, going into Gaza. Just today, there were 243 yeah, on an those average numbers of 100. Uh, no, they're not disputed. They're facts, uh, Christian. We, we can no, they're not, we can because the UN said things. that before the war, but there the were facts. 500 trucks going into Gaza and yeah. uh, around 150 so Christian, I'm talking about food. food now. We're not, yes. sending in, we're not sending in cement anymore. Anyway, I don't we're want to argue about the numbers of trucks. I'm not because asking you about trucks. I'm talking about the fact... to build a terror network. Yeah. Uh, concrete has been used to build uh, We're not talking uh, about that either right you know, now. We're talking about... No, because you, you talked, Krishnan, about the aid trucks. We're saying that we're talking about food. There were 70 yeah. before the war. Today, there were 240. Well, again, I must say, the, the 70 before the war food. is a disputed Those number. Those are the facts, Krishnan. Well, it's not no, a fact, it's a disputed, it's a claim, and it's disputed. And well, there are Krishnan, contradictory, there are contradictory numbers. Everything I say is disputed. Let, let's yeah, move but, on to know, the facts. We are, which, we which are a democratic that... country with a free press and uh, with, with checks and balances. And, you know, at some point, you've got to uh, take our side over a genocidal uh, terrorist no, organization. we don't take anyone's Original. sides. We're journalists Unruh. asking questions. Screw the evidence. The evidence is, is, is irrelevant. You should take our side because we're a democracy, right? Now, that's not how these things should work, right? You need to provide evidence. You can't just say, you should like us because we're like you. And even if it were, I'm not sure a formal democracy, but with an added sprinkle of apartheid really deserves the benefit of the doubt from anyone. Now, the debate there about trucks was somewhat confusing, which was perhaps Mensa's intention. As far as I can make out, the dispute is over how aid trucks specifically are defined. So everyone agrees more goods were getting into Gaza before October the 7th than are now, including food. But Israel claims that when it comes to food aid, the number has increased. Now, that is itself disputed. But even if it were true, it's fairly meaningless. That's because Gaza needed much less food aid before October the 7th, because before Israel's genocidal war started, it still had a semblance of a functioning economy. Obviously, it had been under siege for years, so it wasn't a particularly strong or healthy economy, but it had a semblance of a functioning economy. What's clear now, as a result of Monday night's attack, desperately needed aid will shrink even further. As Guru Murphy said, aid ships have been turned around after the killing of international aid workers. And the second largest humanitarian agency in Gaza, Anera, has now ceased its operations entirely. Later in the interview, Krishnan Guru Murphy went on to ask Mensa about the other 196 aid workers killed by Israel. As you can guess, the Israeli spokesperson tried to smear them all. And Mensa also said, Israel were trying to de-radicalize Gaza, presumably by killing everyone. But the interview ended like this. Can I ask you as a matter of fact, did Israel bomb the Iranian consulate in Syria? 
Uh, so I've got no comment on that. But what I can share okay, with fine. you is that uh, Daniel Hagari uh, said quite clearly that it wasn't a civilian embassy. It was um, a military base for Al Quds. So while I can't okay, but confirm you're not going or to admit deny it. or... or uh, no, as I said, that was a military base for the Al-Quds force. Iran, unfortunately, once again, trying to destabilize this region, not for the good of the Palestinian people, not for the good of the, the Arab world at yeah. large, but okay. just to destabilize this region. We're trying to go for peace. We're trying to go for coexistence, but we need to I'm get sorry, rid of David, I'm sorry, David, I've got to cut, of, of cut you off there. Because, um, I mean, sure. I'm, I'm trying, just trying to get answers to questions, and if you can't answer the question, Good then I can't allow you to do the propaganda bit afterwards. But, David Mensa, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> You're, such such You're such a sweetheart. You're such a sweetheart. Dahlia, do these people actively want to sound like gangsters? I mean, I think saying that he sounds like a gangster is making him sound a lot cooler than he does sound. He's you know, second fiddle to Elon Levy, and it shows. Uh, and I'm also old enough to remember the last time I saw this David Mensah guy, which was when he was squealing at James Schneider for being a lover of evil Hamas, as, you know, James Schneider just sort of sat there looking really bewildered. Um, you know, we're really not sending our best to to Israel when it comes to their spokespeople. Um, in the kind of, in the full clip of that interview, uh, Mensah said something that I thought was very telling which he said, um, as well as de-radicalizing Gaza, um, they also want to return to peace. And so the implication there is that what he, that peace to him is the situation pre-October 7th. And so ultimately what he means by that is that peacetime to him is a blockade by land, sea and air um, that Israel had on Gaza, um, a you know where they could con they controlled the food intake of Gazans to the calorie. They joked about putting Gaza on a diet. Um, when in terms of having um, you know in the West Bank the ongoing confiscation of Palestinian land by illegal settlements, that to David Mensah is peacetime, and that's what concerns me is that in over the past five months. Israel has raised the threshold of violence so significantly that the idea of returning to a blockade, um, to such a violation of sovereignty that was the relationship, um, you know, that has been the relationship over the past several decades, um, that that is somehow a peace, like a form of peace. Um, but it could go the other way. It could be that what has happened over the past five months has raised the consciousness of the world so much, you know, of everyday people to realize that what is happening in Gaza and also what is happening in the West Bank is not just this faraway conflict, but it is actually an occupation, an expression of power that is actually very intimately tied to all of our democratic freedoms. We have seen our democratic freedoms being violated, whether it's our freedom to protest, whether it's our freedom um, to be heard by our elected officials, um, that these things have been comp the, the kind of the extent to which um, the kind of ideology and power structure represented by Israel in the US really compromises that for all of us, that none of us are free whilst this occupation is able to continue. So I wonder which way it's going to go. I wonder if the idea of returning back to the kind of de facto form of occupation that we did have um, before October will be considered a return to peace, which is, I'm sure, what the Israelis would want it to, con want it to be considered. Um, or whether there is a renewed consciousness um, that means that not only um, do we want a ceasefire, not only do we demand a ceasefire, not only do we demand um, you know, the end of this genocide, but also a demand to prevent um, and to, to redress the historic injustices um, that has been faced by Gaza, by Palestinians in, and in Gaza and in the West Bank over the past several decades. I just thought that him calling it a return to peace was such a chilling statement and really showed the extent to which um, Palestinians are not human beings in the eyes of David Mensah. But I do think that Palestinians have become more visible in the eyes of everyday people around the world. And I just hope that their vision of what the future for Palestinians should be wins out against the, the likes of David Mensah. 
I think that's very well put. I mean, I, I think as well, sort of credit where it's due, Christian Guru Murphy's sort of final line, if you can't answer the questions, I can't allow you to do the propaganda bit afterwards, was was very well put. Um, talking of propaganda, I was looking today at David Mentz's former life as a Labour talking head and critic of Jeremy Corbyn. This came up. It's from 2015 in The Telegraph. So why Jeremy Corbyn's rise makes British Jews afraid by someone called Angela Epstein. Now, in the piece... Angela Epstein writes this. Meanwhile, for Jews like me, there's a sense of something sinister in the air. I'd even go so far as to say that the atmosphere could be likened to how the Jews of Germany felt in the early 1930s. Not that I'm suggesting the man now leading the Labour Party is a murderous racist with plans to start a world war or annihilate European Jewry. And I know there will be some who think that invoking memories of the Nazis and by association the Holocaust is at best a cheap shot and at worst utterly deplorable. But look no further than David Mentzer, a former director of Labour Friends of Israel, who has just left the party after 20 years as a result of Corbyn's election. As he says, when I listen to Corbyn speak on almost any issue, I get the feeling this is a man who doesn't like my community. So this is someone in 2015 making the argument that Jeremy Corbyn is a racist, a threat to Britain's Jews. What's our evidence? Look no further than David Mentzer, this very neutral figure who at the time was a former director of Labour Friends of Israel and is now a literal spokesperson for the Israeli government when they are committing what most people in Britain see as a genocidal war, right? This was the kind of person who was put forward as a reasonable, uh, as a reasonable sort of uh, lodestar for how we should think about Jeremy Corbyn, right? Tells you a lot that that gets into the Telegraph in 2015. Look no further than David Mensah. What's he doing now? He's literally out on our television screens justifying a genocidal war on behalf of the Israeli government, working for the Israeli government. Dahlia, um, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me. And thanks for doing that amazing interview with that um, doctor. That was really, really, really interesting. I really enjoyed it. Wow. Yeah, really, really, really Im Im impressive, articulate guy. Um, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Make sure to come back tomorrow for another stream from 6pm. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.